Hello and thanks for joining us for Sustaining Us, a brand new series here on KLCS PBS. I'm David Nazar. Throughout the year, we're going to bring you informative and educational field reports and expert guests to discuss vital environmental and economic sustainability issues. Everything from climate change, clean air, water, technology and healthcare, to education, pandemics and housing. We begin our broadcast with California and rain. As odd as this sounds, given decades of drought, is California on the brink of a massive flood of biblical proportions, a phenomenon so great, some scientists say this could be the costliest natural disaster in world history. Earthquakes, wildfires, mudslides. Mother Nature can be a mad scientist when she wants to unleash her fury on California. For decades, the Golden State has been battling these natural disasters. Well, these days you can possibly add one more looming natural disaster. Many climate scientists who study extreme weather say California could expect a statewide flood of almost Noah's Ark biblical proportion. Daniel Swain studies extreme weather events like drought, floods, and storms. Swain is a climate scientist at the Institute of Environment and Sustainability at UCLA and has just published a special report on climate change and its relation to California flooding. We definitely have seen uh, more of a water deficit than, than, than overabundance recently. But in the long run, there is actually a history of very significant floods in California. If you go back over decades, there are certain parts of the state small regions of the state that have experienced serious or even devastating floods. The Great Flood of 1862 is really the flood of reckoning in California. So it was a, a dramatically different world back then when this flood came and essentially turned the Central Valley into an inland sea and inundated places in the San Francisco Bay Area and in Los Angeles County and Orange County. The Great Flood of 1862 began with heavier than normal rainfall and snowfall, which turned into a deluge of rain of narrow bands of dense, rapidly traveling water vapor called atmospheric rivers filled the sky about a mile above sea level. These rivers in the sky were able to transport 15 times more water vapor than the amount of liquid water that flows from the Mississippi River into the Gulf of Mexico. Atmospheric rivers happen a few times every year, and when they occur over days, flood risk increases. That's part of the reason scientists are now concerned that California could be due for another catastrophic flood. As the climate warms, this risk of flooding in the coming decades is likely to increase pretty dramatically relative to what it has been historically there is something like a 50% chance that this event could happen between now and 2060. So essentially, a one in two chance of this event occurring in the next 40 years or so. How serious is a flooding going to be? In the Central Valley, for example, that might include inundating an area all the way from the southern San Joaquin Valley to the northern Sacramento Valley, and that would include cities like Fresno and Sacramento and Modesto and Stockton. It would inundate a significant portion of the Bayshore regions in the San Francisco Bay Area. This sort of storm would also be associated with strong winds, which would actually cause a certain sort of storm surge. So this flow of water into the bay from the ocean combined with the flood waters from the rainfall potentially inundate parts of Silicon Valley. And if we go down to Southern California, large parts of LA County that lie in natural floodplains would probably also be inundated. It's possible that the LA River flood channels would be seriously challenged by a flood of this magnitude. Orange County, San Diego County, a similar story. Millions of people now live in places that the last time this happened were underwater. The total economic damages, both the direct losses plus the indirect economic losses as a result of, of, of lost businesses and economic activity in the wake of the event, would be essentially a trillion dollar disaster should this recur. And that would make it the most expensive natural disaster in the history of the world. 
It depends on how hysterical you want to get. To really push public policy based on theories and nothing proven is kind of difficult for me. Brett Barbary has worked in the water industry for over 20 years. Barbary is a board member of the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, the largest water agency in the world. And he is also a board member of the Municipal Water District of Orange County. We met Barbary out here at the Santa Ana River, which helps control storm runoff. The Santa Ana River runs from the San Gorgonio Mountains through Riverside County on into Orange County and then out to the Pacific Ocean. Barbary, a staunch conservative, says he's concerned that climate scientists are scaremongering when talking about a repeat of the Great Flood because of climate change. For them to make these pronouncements where things definitely are going to be 100 years from now, we don't know that. We, we can't figure these things out. And scientists are very smart and they look at lots of numbers, but if they're off just a little bit in, in one level, like you've seen, it throws off all the models down the road. So I trust the farmers to figure these things out because they understand how nature works. They understand how their fields need to be planted, how they need to fallow those. They don't need some bureaucrat in Sacramento or DC telling them what to do. So I, I tend to side with the farmers who are actually there working in the soil and they're more weather dependent than scientists are. You side with them more so than the climate absolutely, scientists? Absolutely, absolutely. Why is that? Because they're, they're more practical. They have the hands-on experience. It's, it's one thing to live in an ivory tower working on your models, and that's great, and that's fun to do, and it's good to debate that. But when you have to put it into reality and, and put it into action, it's very different. To be clear, are you discounting or possibly even disputing some of the science that these climate scientists gather regarding the flood or climate change? Look, there, we are gonna have floods in the future. To put it all on climate change, I, I think it's ridiculous. Nature has a way of working in cycles. We're in a little warmer cycle now, it'll go back. As a public policy person, you look at risk, you look at the science, you look what's out there, and to really base all of your decisions based on what might happen, a percent may happen in the future, I think is folly. The critical question becomes, what level of protection are we willing to pay for? So flood protection, comes at a cost. Benjamin Preston is the director of Infrastructure Resilience and Environmental Policy at the RAND Corporation. This climate scientist studies climate risk management. He says dealing with catastrophic weather events can be a challenge to find the best solution. We have to figure out you know, how much are we willing to pay in order to completely mitigate or climate proof Southern California and Los Angeles from a future flood event. And so we have to balance risk on one hand with cost-effective solutions. Um, and in so doing, inherently we're going to run into trade-offs. So we don't want to spend two dollars to avoid one dollar in damages, right? So trying to understand what is a reasonable level of protection, and what society is willing to accept in terms of risk is critically important. And the science can inform that, but ultimately that's a matter of public policy and, and public deliberation. So when it comes to flood risk, uh, effectively the sort of default standard level of protection that you know, we're used to and have accepted is a one in a hundred year event um, or a one percent chance of a, a particular flood level in a given year. Um, but there are other standards out there and it comes down to an understanding of cost and how much we're willing to pay. Man and nature can coexist in many ways and we've done a tremendous job in figuring out how to overcome that. A modern recurrence of this event would be an economically devastating event for California should it recur in the near future. Joining me now to discuss this further is David Colgan. David is with UCLA's Institute of the Environment and Sustainability. He's also an author and teaches science communications. Thanks for being here, David. Thank you, David. Two polar opposites in this field report. You've got the scientists and you've got the water expert. The water expert is saying, you folks, the scientists live in an ivory tower. What is your take on that? You know, I, I think he relies a lot on sort of linguistic tropes that aren't really accurate in this situation. Um, a couple of things that really tipped me off to that while I was listening to him talking were his confusion of the term theory. Right, like he uses theory in the colloquial sense, which we, you know, we understand as a hunch or a suspicion, right? More than what it means in the scientific sense, which is something that's been proven time and time again through, you know, observation, tests, 
and, and relying on facts over a long period of time. And so I think that's either unintentional misinformation or, or possibly even uh, intentional obfuscation of, of the issue. However, you use the word facts. He says he bases his facts not on science or the scientists. He listens to the farmers, David. Sure. I mean, that's that's pretty anecdotal as far as I'm concerned. Uh, you know, and I'm not sure which farmers he's talking to in this case. Um, you know, across California, I think there's this, and the and across the country, there's this sort of um, understanding of the sort of single family farmer who sort of tills their own land and, and like is just like a good of the earth person. Um, but I mean, the reality in California is most of this land that's getting farmed is big agribusiness. It's, uh, you know, it's big companies that are distributing around the country and around the world. So if he's listening to them, yet they, they may also be filling his campaign coffers. When we listen to this story, it's a sort of an example, David, of what's happening in the United States, the divide. We've got the scientists, we've got I don't know if you would call Brett Barber a science denier. He just, I don't know if he believes everything that the scientists are saying. What is your take on the divide that we're having in the United States over climate change, global warming, and the climate science? I mean, I think my personal take, uh, I mean, it's complex. There's a lot of moving parts here. Uh, but. This all starts with some intentional disinformation coming out of the oil industry, out of fossil fuel industry, where you know they kind of saw what happened and how quickly the aerosol industry was turned on its head after the ozone hole became a big thing in the news, and they were much readier with their information campaign and have intentionally cast doubt on science. And you hear that through the voices of people like Brett Barbary. If you hear that through the voices of people all around the country. And it's just not fact-based information. It's, uh, it's talking points and they have an agenda. Yet some of the voices in the United States are saying, hey, we get there is climate change, we get there's global warming, but we're worried about our job. We're worried about the education of our kids. We're worried about paying the rent. Folks believe in climate science, I believe. It just doesn't seem it's a priority, David. Yeah, I think there's a, a real um, issue with, um, and, and, and this is completely understandable that people are focused on their day-to-day -day lives and what they need to do to survive and thrive and have their families um, be successful uh, in the world. That's 100% understandable. Um, and that's all stuff that needs to be part of whatever solutions we come up with to climate change. Uh, you know, it, it has to include jobs. It has to include education about the world and about uh, the science that describes the world. Um, and, and we're not there yet. So it's, it's not something that can be separated out in my, in my mind. That the idea that we treat the environment, right, as some discrete issue, instead of the entire world and existence that we all depend upon for all of those things that you mentioned, is, is a real, um, I, think, I think that's a, that's a real bit of misdirection. Yet some of this could be based on the fact that scientists, even your scientists at UCLA, possibly just don't get the message out there, right? The science messaging is not there because it seems that folks don't, or some folks don't believe what the science has to say. Yeah, I mean, I think that's partly my job as a science communicator. Um, and, uh, in, and it's certainly something that we see is that, that you know, scientists who are really on, in a day-to-day -day basis sort of acquainted with the facts and are really deep in the information have trouble perceiving what the common perception is as a fact in question, right? Like they need to understand that these perspectives, they may not be valid to them because they're so deep in the data, but they exist in the world and they have to be dealt with in a respectful way, I think. And so I think the more scientists can treat those perspectives, not in a sort of condescending way, but in a way that meets them where they are uh, and, and, and tries to, uh, and tries not to demonize the, those sort of misperceptions, um, the better off we'll all be. You use the word condescending, and it takes me back to a quote in the field report I put together where Brett Barbary said basically, quote, this is folly, meaning this is nonsense. And that's condescending to many people, probably you included in your scientists. Yeah, there were a couple things I found a little bit condescending. Uh, that's certainly that's certainly condescending. The idea that uh, these findings of of actual scientific papers that are peer reviewed 
are quote pronouncements of what will happen in 100 years is completely misdirection as well in my opinion um and not even really in my opinion it's just straight up mis misdirection i mean these are per they're they're certainly per doing projections of what may happen in 100 years or what they anticipate will happen based on the facts their observations um and, and a whole lot of information but we're not saying yes this will certainly happen in 100 years right we're just projecting this is the best we we know based on the information we have available to us yet you realize and you have to know this when some people hear that scientists are saying there's going to be a great flood of biblical proportions which is going to demolish california and all kinds of catastrophic damage people are going to be like well that's crazy and where do scientists get this data so in defense of red barbary and i'm not defending him because we all have to believe in the science but maybe he's saying there's a more centrist approach where we might, it might not be so extreme. Yeah, I mean, I think though, <laughs> you know, when we're balancing sort of our, our economic goals with dealing with global impacts, we need to be a little bit more realistic and a little bit more farsighted. Um, we're talking in this case, it's about a flood that we have experienced, right? We have saw it in, in the 1860s, right? Where it, you know, the, the governor had to canoe from the second floor of his Sacramento home to be inaugurated. And uh, and the fact is, is that this happened then, it certainly can happen again. And all the data that, that we are looking at shows that it, that it may well be more likely now that climate is changing. David Colgan of UCLA, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for the interview. Thank you, David. And now we travel to the San Diego, Mexico border region where rain, flooding and the possible climate change connection are causing water pollution problems in our border waterway. PBS station KPBS in San Diego visits with Wild Coast, an international nonprofit environmental organization. Reporter Eric Anderson has the story. Wild Coast's Paloma Aguirre stands just a few hundred yards north of the U.S.-Mexico border. She's in Goat Canyon. It's one of five places where sewage-tainted water from Mexico flows freely into the United States. It's catastrophic. For anybody who doesn't know this area or about this issue, it's very simple. It's one of the biggest environmental disasters that our country suffers every single year. And now with climate change um, forecasting uh, more intense storm events, we're going to see this problem exacerbated over time. Goat Canyon is actually a success story of sorts. Aguirre is standing beside two large catch basins that keep sediment from swamping wetlands in a nearby state park. Whenever it rains, it's a, it's a canyon, it drains, the Los Laureles Creeks flows across the border and into this area. There's a pollution collector nearby that routes tainted water flow to the International Wastewater Sewage Treatment Plant. That facility was built to help treat cross-border flows during dry weather. Meanwhile, these catch basins keep sediment out of sensitive habitat just a few hundred yards away. One key feature is the small fence that reaches across this basin. These are the only types of trash booms in the entire Tijuana River Valley. They're highly effective, especially for very um, for high floatables. As you can see, there's a lot of plastic bottles. There's a lot of foam. Um, and that is because in Mexico, in the state of Baja California, and in the city of Tijuana, they don't have a formal recycling program. What happens if this barrier is not here and these plastics and the tires and the sediment reach the wetlands that are just over the hill there? I mean, we had a case where um, there was a construction project in Tijuana, so they just cut the, the hillside there. There was no... Uh, plan for sediment control and all of that excess sediment destroyed about uh, I think it was between 30 and 40 acres of wetland and salt marsh habitat so it's incredibly detrimental to the system and obviously plastic input into the ocean marine debris is one of the biggest challenges we will face in the next decade or two we have studies that overwhelmingly um, uh, you know come to consensus that we'll have more plastics in the ocean than fish by 2050. The catch basins and trash booms were put in place by state officials to protect sensitive habitat at Borderfield State Park. And Aguirre says 
There are lessons here for other locations in the Tijuana River Valley. Just a short distance to the east, the bridge over Dairy Mart Road separates a wide sweeping valley and more rugged river habitat. This sturdy concrete structure was built after flooding washed out the old bridge in the 1990s. This is a point where the river forest or the riparian habitat begins. So a lot of the trash and tires that are carried by the storm flows become trapped in the vegetation. Um, and whatever is not trapped makes its way downstream into the estuary and ultimately into the ocean. On this side of the bridge, the river valley is open, but this bucolic stretch of land changes dramatically when rain drenches the region. The small trickle of a river during dry times can become a raging torrent of swirling pollution. When there's a strong storm event, this can be completely covered in water and the river can be flowing at a rate of a billion gallons of water per day, most of which is completely sewage tainted and, and polluted. Aguirre would like to see some of the lessons from Goat Canyon applied here. She says catch basins could capture wet weather sewage flows, sediment and trash. She says the International Wastewater Plant on this side of the border and Tijuana's sewage system frequently fall short. There's a pump station right at the border that is capturing all of that flow and sending it south from us, preventing that flow from coming across the border. The problem is that pump station breaks down all the time because it gets clogged with sediment, because it gets clog clogged with trash. So. Um, some of those, uh, when that pump station fails and some of those flows um, could be captured by the sediment basin. Aguirre says the tainted water that currently fouls the ocean and forces health officials to close South County beaches could be held until it's treated. Federal officials say a lack of funding keeps them from building that infrastructure, but local critics say there is a lack of will. That's why Imperial Beach, Chula Vista, the Port of San Diego, California, and Surfrider San Diego are suing the federal government. They hope the courts compel the International Boundary and Water Commission to stop the cross-border sewage flows that pollute U.S. waters. Eric Anderson, KPBS News. Thank you, Eric Anderson and KPBS for that report. Now to waterway problems in Arizona and the fight to preserve that state's rivers. This next story is brought to you through a special collaboration with KLCS PBS and Arizona State University's Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications as we partner with and mentor students seeking to explore the environment through their reporting. Here is Madison Staten with Cronkite News. It's a tale of two rivers. One, the Verde, runs into the valley from northern Arizona. The other, the San Pedro, flows up into the state from Mexico. Both rivers are at the center of lawsuits, filed with the hope of protecting each of them. The story of Arizona rivers is that we have demonstrated many times that we can dry them up, but we haven't demonstrated that we can save them. That's why in March, the Center for Biological Diversity filed an intent to sue the U.S. Forest Service over cattle damage along the Verde River. There's been multiple reports uh, from the public and from us to the Forest Service that there's uh, cows out on these protected rivers and the Forest Service just hasn't been doing enough to fix the problem and so we knew we had to take it to the next level. The U.S. Forest Service said in a statement that the agency has some preventative management options to help, like fencing and designating specific areas for cattle to access the water. The Verde isn't the only Arizona River with livestock degradation. In southern Arizona, it's happening on the San Pedro River. The Center for Biological Diversity and other partners like the Sierra Club filed litigation this spring to protect the San Pedro from livestock grazing. The lawsuit against the Bureau of Land Management challenges what the center reports as unregulated grazing. And that's not the only lawsuit. The two groups, along with other partners, also files a lawsuit to protect the San Pedro from groundwater pumping. Sandy Barr says this is one of the biggest threats facing the San Pedro. Sections of the river that were once perennial, meaning they flowed year round, uh, are, are no longer um, flowing year round. The lawsuit is against the U.S. Army and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The regional director for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service wrote in a statement that they are working with partners to reduce new well drilling and promote efficient water technologies on agricultural lands. 
Both San Pedro lawsuits are in the early stages. I'm Madison Staten, Cronkite News. Thanks, Madison Staten and the Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications for that report. For more information about our program, just click on klcs.org and then click Contact Us to send us your questions and comments or story ideas so we can hear from you. Thank you so much for joining us for this edition of Sustaining Us here on KLCS-PBS. I'm David Nazar.